Hey, once again, time for Dr. David Klein to drop into the Resource Hour, bring us up to date with something that the people in this part of the state, the villages, surrounding communities, Mount Dora, Eustis, Tavares, all up and down, all of you have probably known somebody or you yourself has experienced a joint replacement. That's pretty common in these parts. I mean, I've talked to people in the villages who say, yeah, one year I had my hip replaced, the next year I got two knees replaced, same time. That was a little bit crazy, but, hey, I lived through it, and I'm still golfing every day. So, Dr. Joint Replacement, tell us about it. Well, here is the interesting thing about joint replacement. And it's the thing you're not necessarily going to hear, but it, it's one thing that drives orthopedic surgeons crazy because this is their bread and butter. Everybody is going to hear, gee, we think that you're going to need to have your knees replaced because after all, it's quote unquote, bone on bone. And that sounds awful when you think about it, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Okay, it sounds like you ought to be just limping in misery. But in fact, you've been walking around pretty much just fine, but your knee hurts a little bit. Bone on bone is not a reason to do anything. It simply means that the cartilage is worn away. You know, cartilage does wear away, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to do anything. What's more is it doesn't necessarily imply that it's causing the pain to begin with. Mm -hmm. Because what? Why would that be? Why would it not be that bone on bone is causing pain? It's because the pain fibers that surround the bone actually are in the membrane called the periosteum. Okay? And guess what? All that wore away. Okay, so really the bone on bone is not causing any pain at all. Okay, the periosteum is elsewhere. It's in the intact portion of the bone. But what will cause pain in a joint like that is inflammation from the, uh, let's say the particles, the debris, the garbage that's thrown into the joint. It causes an inflammatory response in the bursa surrounding the joint. This is a lubricating sac. Okay, it causes a bursitis and an arthritis, but not necessarily as a result of bone on bone. So what do they do? They go ahead and they start cutting away at at living tissue, replace it with a piece of surgical steel, a couple pieces of Teflon. Okay, and if you wake up after that, good for you. The problem is that every time you go in for joint replacement, you're rolling the dice. Everybody Mm. likes a winner. Nobody likes a loser. Okay, but a significant number of of people that go in for joint replacement end up with problems that they really didn't bargain for. My favorite one is something called reflex sympathetic dystrophy or CRPS. When you're doing like a knee, for example, you're putting a a tourniquet in the upper thigh, two of them actually. That's one big tournament made made up of two, and you're inflating it to 450 tor maybe more. Now, what's mm. your blood pressure run? Uh, about 130 to 150. This is 450, and it keeps you from bleeding to death when they do the surgery. It's called a tourniquet. But underneath that tourniquet is something odd called the saphenous nerve. You can clip the saphenous nerve right at the border of this uh, tourniquet, and it can cause lifelong pain. A lot of failed mm. knees actually aren't the joint going bad, but it's the nerve being clipped. I've seen very. I've seen a lot of patients over the past 30 years that have had persistent joint pain of the knee following a single knee replacement or several knee replacements, which they keep mm. redoing because they can't figure out why the joint hurts. It's sickening, if nothing else. Now, what's the first thing that you want to do if you have a, a joint that's gone bad? More times than that, losing weight, for God's sake. When I was at Duke, we wouldn't replace people's knees if they were overweight. Why? Because if you did replace the knee and you only knew that it was going to last five to ten years and that was going to be accelerated if they were heavy, nobody wanted their name on the op note for that individual where the knee failed. Hmm. So the first thing we would do would be to have people lose weight, and we would do whatever it took to get them to lose weight. The same thing is true of hips. Hip replacement, same thing. It's bone on bone. That doesn't explain the fact that, you know, you're, you're not limping three weeks ago and now you are. You think the bone worked its way through over the past three weeks? No, inevitably it's something else where physical diagnosis was missed and more times than not somebody is looking for an excuse to put their kid through college. You do not want to be that excuse. But failed joint surgery is a big deal. How do they fail? They fail because of either complications involving the nerve, but my favorite ones are infection. When these joints mm. these they get infected, it is a disaster. Depending upon where you are, you may or may not have increasing difficulty finding a surgeon to replace an infected joint. Okay, so the first guy says, well, you know, I don't do infected joints. I'm going to refer you out. Nobody's going to want to touch you. You know, from you know, the university straight on down, nobody with any brains is going to want to touch an infected joint like that. And, you know, that has somebody else's name on the replacement. That's a no-win situation for the doc, but it's an always-lose situation for you. 
Now, let's say wow. that you've made the decision to have your joint replaced. Well, good for you. Okay, you've had the joint replaced. Maybe good for you. What can you do to harden the bone? Which, by the way, was the problem to begin with. Why did the darn things, you know, they, why'd they wear away? It's because you had no estrogen on board. Okay, women, osteoporosis results from that. With men, it's typically because their testosterone's too low and the bone wears away as a result of that. But you can go through, get the hormones replaced. If it's testosterone, it's very, very easy. If it's estrogen and progesterone, it's a little bit uh, trickier, but it's no big deal. And harden the bone. By getting the hormonal balance in place before you do the surgery, you have a much better chance of doing well. And post-surgically, you need to do it in order to heal the darn thing anyway. But what else? There's a mineral called strontium. Now, we got people out there, well, they told me to take calcium. Well, good. Why didn't they tell you to take calcium 15 years ago? It wouldn't have made any difference, but at least they would have been consistent. Now that you've got this damage, they're going ahead and making a recommendation after the fact. It makes absolutely no sense at all. So strontium is the chemical. It is the mineral. It is the agent that acts like rebar to uh, to cement. It holds everything together. So the first thing that I do is I have people pick up a chelated strontium. You know, the chemical would be strontium citrate. Dosage is 200 milligrams, two, three, maybe four times a day. That will make the calcium stay in matrix. Calcium hydroxyapatite is the calcium that you want, not this calcium carbonate, calcium oxide junk that most people pick up. And then vitamin K2 and vitamin D3. So it's strontium, calcium hydroxyapatite, vitamin K2, vitamin D3. This will help you harden the bone. That is what you must do and you probably should be doing now. If your friends are getting joint replacements, odds are you're at risk too. Why? Because we don't hang out with teenagers typically, okay? So people in your age cadre are going through the same problems that you're gonna go through. So take the advice I just gave you, do it. I do it, I invite you to do the same. Some of the pastimes that are really enjoyed by the 50 plus crowd, one of them is golf. Golf has got to put a lot of pressure on even the healthiest knees and hips. Okay. Uh, I, one of my patients is an extremely well-known uh, golf pro. Yes, sir. Okay. He's a pro, yeah, pro uh, teacher is really what he does. He's got a little uh, uh, deal going out west of Orlando. And I asked him, I said, I said uh, maybe I should learn how to play golf. And his response is, hell no, are you crazy? In any event, if you have already been bitten by the bug, golf is a very, very stressful game. Okay, people think that it's just walking along through a field, but it's not so. What you're doing is asymmetrically loading your joints, loading your lower back, loading your shoulders, and doing what may be the world's most unnatural physical act in any sport that there is. Mm -hmm. So it tears up the hip, typically the non-dominant hip. So if your right hand's the left hip that takes a, a beating, it would be the left elbow, the right shoulder, the left neck. Why? Because when you're there uh, doing a drive, okay, this is where the damage occurs. Where else are you going to get hurt? Well, we're going to ignore the odd alligator. You know, so you go after a ball. If the ball goes in the water, leave it alone. Okay, don't go after it. Leave that for the tourists. You know, uh, they call them righty. You know, why? Because he lost his lost his left hand going for a ball <laughs> in there. Alligator bite. Brilliant. So. The drive is what gets most people. Sand trap gets the rest. Why? Because when they're in there and they hit that sand, it, it jolts their whole system. You do not mm -hmm. need to be doing this, or if you are doing it, be very, very careful. One last thing is on your golf shoes, see what you can do to file off those, those uh, cleats. Okay, why? Oh. Because the cleats tear up the lower back. If, you're, if you have to have a cleat to keep your feet planted, you're going to do damage to your lower back because you would far rather have your heel slip and save your back than have it planted in the earth and then tear the the, uh, the, the torque in your lower back. It's easier to heal uh, you know, the ground than it is to uh, heal mm -hmm. your lower back. And we've talked about in other shows the importance in senior fitness of uh, stretching a bit before you even go out there and try to do this. But we've also talked about the therapeutic swimming. And uh, Lord knows these communities up here have a lot of swimming pools. So best run around in the pool. Do the best that you can. You are blessed with having facilities. You're blessed with having time to do it. And you are blessed with having Florida weather. But there are things that you need to do to protect your joints. There are things that you need to do to prevent the inevitable illnesses, injuries, and whatnot. But vitamin K2, vitamin D3, strontium, 
Very, very important for this. And Hormone fish oil. And fish oil, of course. All right. And where would I find those things? I want to know exact shelf location at the stages of life. Where do I go? I don't think I can tell you the shelf locations. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we do have people in the health store that will help you find everything. So do come on in. Uh, give us a call at 407-679-3337. Uh, office hours are Monday through Thursday, 8 to 5. We are located in Longwood at 1917 Booth Circle. That's right off of I-4 and 434. Our website is stagesoflife.net, and we're also on Facebook at Stages of Life Medical Institute.